Welcome to Bitch Talk, booze interviews straight from the heart of San Francisco. I'm Erin. That's Ange. Hi. That's Char. Hello. You can find us at bitchtalkpodcast.com where you can sign up for our monthly e-news. For behind the scenes videos and two minute clips of our interviews, head to our YouTube channel and subscribe. You can find us every other Thursday morning at 9.30 a.m. at bff.fm. And if you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For the love of God, do it. It really helps. Well, hello, bitch talkers. We are sitting... (laughs) The Ritz Carlton. We're in an in-person press day. It's crazy with the directors of Everything Everywhere All at Once, the Daniels, but also known as Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert. Welcome to Bitch Talk. Thank you. So Thank much. you. We're excited to be here. <laughs> COVID negative in a room with you. I know it's it's crazy. Um, this I'm, is uh, Daniel Kwan's voice, so you can recognize it in the future. And, and this is Daniel Scheinert's. It doesn't sound very different. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Good, good luck. <laughs> Um, I'm going to go with Daniel Kwan. Can you tell our audience what Everything Everywhere All at Once is about? Um, Yeah, it's about a lot of things. Um, It's about everything. So it's very hard to talk about sometimes, but we've been summing it up as it's a family movie. It's a movie about a mother who's trying to reconnect with her husband and her daughter um, in the middle of, you know, the chaos that is modern life. Um, And then, of course, uh, things are never so simple in our movies. And so she gets swept up in this multiversal cosmic um, action movie, musical love drama, um, you know, cinema fest. It's, 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 it truly is a little bit of everything. Um, but I think we did it that way because it felt like the most honest uh, reflection of what modern life feels like. It, you know, right now when you scroll through Twitter, you're laughing at sad things and crying at happy things. And, and, you know, there's weird, uh, I don't know, internet memes all mixed up with stuff about Ukraine. It's like really, it's it's an overwhelming experience. And we wanted to try to find a way to capture that in a um capture that in the film so the audiences can feel seen, you know? I have to tell you, I told my mom um, about the title of this film, like, oh, da, 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 and she's like, oh, that feels like now. Like, oh, I didn't even have to tell perfect. her what the film was. So yes, that's you got great. that demo, a 70 year old plus demo. Perfect. Um, I'm so happy. <laughs> <laughs> um, I actually wanted to go back to your origin story because I tried to Google, like, how did you guys meet? Where are you from? Because you both are basically, I'm just going to say it, creative life partners. Mm-hmm. So, how did you two meet? And how did this happen? Yeah, I watch movies about like uh, marital strife, and and I'll be like, ooh, that reminds me of me and Dan more than me and my partner, because <laughs> yeah, being being creative married is uh, is an adventure. Um, yeah, we uh, there's there's a couple different parts of it, but we we met in college, uh, and we have very different learning styles, and so we did not like each other at first. <laughs> uh, I'm the kid in the back just doodling by himself. I don't participate. I really yeah. don't like class settings. So yeah. he's the he was the undiagnosed ADHD kid uh, who was self deprecating, and I was like, oh, he like is wasting his parents' money at film school but, and, and not participating, you know? Whereas I participate too much and was like, that that film school kid is like, shut He's up. He's like, that guy just won't stop talking and I don't even know what he's talking about half the time. Um, so we, yeah, we had very little respect for each other at first. And uh, our friendship, as these things happened, yeah. It really blossomed when Dan came to work at uh, this summer camp that I was working at and uh, we were just supposed to like supervise kids while they make movies. Uh, and we realized we had a very similar summer camp counselor outside of a classroom, you know, like immaturity and enthusiasm. And we got we both got so jealous of the kids that we just started making movies after work. Yeah, because um, I, I, I realized and this is actually really interesting to me. Um, because we are, we are a duo and people always ask about like, what's it like being a directing duo? You know, like, because it's, it's the opposite of everything you learn in school, the auteur theory, there's one mind who, you know, is the, is the genius who crafts these things and going to film school. I didn't feel that way. I didn't feel like I was a singular genius. And so I felt like I couldn't be a director. Also, there mm-hmm. weren't that many directors who looked like me at the time. So it just, mm-hmm. it didn't, I actually didn't think I was going to be a director um, until we started working together. And I realized, Oh, we can just be, 
we don't have to be like auteurs. We can be summer camp counselors. And if we just treat our, our film sets like summer camp and just bring that kind of energy every day, like I can do that. That's something I could, I could finally see myself as a version of a director. Um, and I think that's kind of been our trademark ever since is we are the summer camp counselors. We do warm ups every it morning. It was so confusing yeah. for me because you'd been so shy, you know, in school. And then like I, he did a bunch of summer camps as a kid and like, so you just, it just turned on. I was like, that's a different guy. <laughs> I love that. So I want to talk about this film. Um, the film started being written in 2016. <laughs> Don't prior, it Which is crazy. <laughs> yeah. Pro, when, did, when was that? Prior to the Trump takeover. That's what I'm writing. Mm -hmm. uh, and pandemic. Um, how did our universe end up in this film? And were there any worldly events that actually sort of ended up in the script or in the film? Hearing Bong Joon Ho talk about the fact that um, filmmaking is a really bad art form when it comes to reacting to the world or reacting to modern life because um, our lives move so fast and film takes so long or whatever. Um, but that being said, this film ended up just absorbing all of that anxiety um, that we were experiencing from, you know, basically the Trump campaign to Trump, Trump winning, to everything that happened in those four years. Um, and then, of course, then the pandemic happened. And in the middle of all of that, I had a kid, you know, I bought a house, you know, the, 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 like all of those feelings um, that <laughs> were very strong feelings definitely made it into different drafts. But as time went on and as more drafts happened, we started to take out more of the overt references for the reason that, you know, director bong was talking about it's like it didn't feel it felt like we were just reacting rather than processing and making something um that would you know stand the test of time and i think when you watch this movie like no matter who you are if you are alive right now that means you've you, you've gone through the past four or five years just like us um and you will you will fill it you will fill the movie in with your own experience and that's that's how it has been so far every time we've shown it to people they come up to us and they just talk about how this was the movie they needed to watch right now to, because because uh like i said this movie is trying to um help all of us collectively sort through the chaotic disparate um, contradictions we're all feeling right now so it's all in there and and then it all got removed but like the the essence is still there yeah, not all of it, <laughs> but <laughs> yeah. yeah, we kept things, but um, yeah, I, I, I've been watching movies lately and sometimes I'll really like the movie, but I'll be like, did this filmmaker live through the same last five years as me? Like, why on earth did they write and make this movie oh. after they could have made? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Maybe we can talk off mic yeah, about it. Yeah, do you it. like to gossip? Yeah. Of course. Movies. But, you know, I'm not you know, going to throw anyone. It's like, I thought, I thought uh, uh, oh, now I'm just blanking on Wes Anderson's new movie. <laughs> oh, no, it's French Dispatch. French Dispatch. I haven't seen it's that one It's so yet. lovely. It's beautifully done. Why did he write that during the last five years? I don't know. So maybe someone can convince me that it yeah. was a and, good reaction. Right. So there's an argument <laughs> for escape. He's one of my heroes, so I can, I like to shit talk about my heroes. Yeah, yeah. I'll shit talk. I'll, I'll do it with you. Um, I, personally, licorice pizza. Don't know why. Same thing. Yeah. And Red Rocket. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's interesting because Red Rocket is supposed to be a reaction to like, it's like a Trumpian character, like, mm -hmm. but it is uh, not enjoyable. To, yeah. To... Somewhat affectionate about a Trumpian character, which mm -hmm. I'm yeah, not in the mood for. Right. Yeah. And we had, anyways, we had Sean Baker on for the, his last film, Florida Project, and loved that movie. And I I'm like, really? More. From. That to the, anyways. <laughs> I could watch her eat pancakes for yeah. like a whole sequel. We're just like. Yeah. Yeah. Could have watched that. Um, <laughs> let's just bitch. Um, <laughs> That's it, what this podcast yeah, is about. <laughs> Come on. You need a sticker that says bitch talk. I was like, uh-oh. Like, we're we're so, going to be in trouble. I know. I bad. know. We can edit if you want. Um, it sounds like there was a lot of outside camaraderie offset. Is that how you two set the tone for your films? Especially, I mean, reading the press notes, the Korean barbecue and uh, like yeah. the late night sessions. Can you talk about that? Totally. I mean, I think um, selfishly, we we just want to play. You know, we want to play with our collaborators. And um, sometimes people working in this industry have kind of built up a lot of habits that are kind of, or just like, 
not conducive to that. And so we like to try to find ways to break down people's um, preconceived ideas of how a film shoot should run. And so we do things like, you know, we do morning exercises every morning where we do um, stretches or improv games. You know, one of my favorite games we played with like a, a crew of like 100 people, mind you, this is a big crew. We got everyone in, in the atrium and we're like, okay, we're going to do slow motion fight. This is something we do. you do in theater camp. Everyone just pretends for the next, you know, five minutes that we're in a slow motion battle. And it was just so fun to watch everyone just get so committed in, yeah. in basically like see the lead actors turn around and slow-mo fight one of the grips and like then like an electrician comes up behind them and grabs their imaginary weapon and like and like it was so much fun that you know even jamie lee curtis came up to us and was like i would like to lead one of the the uh, warm-ups and so mm -hmm. she led us in this amazing uh, like 80s style aerobics class and it was so and people were so excited about it and like i feel like starting every day with that kind of energy just gives people the right um the right idea of what we're doing and what we're trying to to achieve which is like um it's not it's not just yes we are doing serious stuff and yes we're um exploring really um important things and themes that that uh, mean a lot to us but all of it is done um through the lens of community and all of it's done through the lens of like building each other up um yeah, which so is like not how we ha we're taught filmmaking should have been you know it's you know most of filmmaking is kind of wrapped around like a dictator. Well, yeah, exactly. It's, it's the, that's the model. It's very much built off of like military. You know, you have the general and, and basically there's all these ranks and everything is about being everything has to be so efficient um, so that, you know, there's no room for for um, error. But then if there's no room for error, then there's no room for surprise and surprise. And I think that's what we're always asking of our crew members and our collaborators is like, please surprise us. Our movie is big enough that we can contain it all. And so I like we do not rather than cutting things out or cutting people out, which is what most art is about. It's about, you know, most art is about distillation. Our art was like trying to say how much can we contain so that we can bring in as much knowing that like we're pretty good editors, like 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 as far as like uh, c computer editors mm -hmm. um, or sorry, um, nonlinear um, final cut. You know all that stuff. Um, we're good well, we at that cut part. In Adobe Premiere. Sorry. Oh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Really I know. I know. Blew it with I'm really, I'm really editing. When we talk about editing, it's tough because it's like we're actually not great editing when it comes to the script stuff. But, but like the final, the the editing of the actual movie, mm -hmm. we we knew we were capable of containing it all, so we kind of allowed everyone to come in and give us everything. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah. What was the question? <laughs> camaraderie on oh, set. Yeah. Do you want to I say give a whole other answer? Yeah. I mean, I, I believe that like the process really affects the product, you know, and uh, with this one, I think once we opened the door to the fact that we wanted like camaraderie amongst the cast, especially, but the cast and crew, like each team member brought in kind of their own ideas in a really beautiful, yeah. fun way. Um, so like Ki Kwan and his wife Echo like organized a big like uh hong kong style like opening ceremony on the first day of the shoot uh where we had to like slice a suckling pig and light incense and uh and then uh and then michelle started inviting folks on weekends to hang out and and different crew members would like organize dinners and and all of that kind of like affected the film and and especially like shout out jamie lee curtis is one of the best gift givers i've ever met that's like yeah. that's her love language and she goes so hard. she was like oh a food truck on friday would show up and it'd be from jamie and yeah. uh and i think it made people work harder and, but it also was kind of like we were living like one of the points of the film you know which is that like kindness can um help can be a weapon you know and we were trying to like pull off the impossible and those acts of kindness i think helped us pull it off they were not distractions you know speaking of weapons uh -huh. and i'm not going to give anything away uh -huh. who okay. came up with the fun props you know what i'm talking about oh <laughs> uh, well that one yeah that idea that this this is what usually happens usually um I'll pitch something as a joke that I hate and I'll be like, let's not put this in the movie, but this, I'm just going to say it because it came into my brain mm -hmm. and I say, uh, we're not going to do that. Right. And then Shiner says, and then I'll be like, no, 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 that's the right one. We're going to keep it, you know? Uh, and then, and then he's extra embarrassed because he knows it was his idea. It's yeah, his exactly. brain's fault, but it was me as a cheerleader who's like, no, it's going to stay. 
And then um, us- usually when when we sleep on it for long enough, we'll be like, okay, I think this is the best way to do it. But you know, the the film plays with this uh, this idea of like improbable actions um, and uh, using improbable actions to launch us into other universes. It's very it's very Douglas Adams Hitchhiker's Guide mm. um, inspired. But um, we we thought it would be really fun to play with the trope of. Um, when you're in an action movie and someone drops a gun and everyone's fighting for the gun. Um, and, you know, Jackie Chan has so many amazing um, choreography moments um, in his uh, his film history that that do that so well. And we were like, what if we did that? But we replaced the gun with 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 something you're things. trying to put in your butt, you know? Right. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And with and that but that things. was like an aha moment where we both suddenly were like that. Oh, we we were missing that fight scene, you know, like something where the absurdity was the high stakes point of the fight, you know? Um, but, uh, but yeah, we had a lot of ideas that did not make the cut and it was always about, um, it always had to check multiple boxes, you know? And it was about like, what would actually freak out the character of Evelyn? We're trying to break her brain and the audience's brain as well along the way. And so certain things we were like, well, that's shock value, but not specific enough to her as a character, you know? Um, so we maybe we were just rationalizing because we thought you know sex toys are funny, but uh, and beautiful and beautiful and interesting. But it, the taboo is funny, yes. you know, to us. The fact that like you know um, some people you know would react the way they do when they watch the movie. Yeah, <laughs> claps, uh, roaring of, of laughing. And there was went... one lady in like one of the test screenings that I got to listen to, who's a few rows behind me, who just started going, oh. Uh, and it was I was really excited about it I said that too Um, (laughs) Andre 3000 is a part of the score how Mm -hmm. what the fuck yeah more so uh, we were pretty shocked too (laughs) yeah we our composers Sun Lux uh, had a very hard job and they worked their butts off um, but they also helped open doors to like other collaborators coming in and contributing to the score um, which is kind of perfect because the, the film is meant to contain every genre um, as you know, again as a as a way to play with the multiverse and so we needed to bring in Randy Newman and Andre 3000 and and Mitski and David Byrne you know it's just like when you read that track list it doesn't make any sense but that's it, it's a perfect encapsulation of the film but they had heard that he you know wanted to uh that he'd been really into flutes and wanted to play flute, you know, and, and as you do, and we were like, uh, yeah, yeah, sure. Come, come do it. Um, and they, at the time we were spread out a little, but they came to LA and we got to go in to a recording booth and, uh, watch he, uh, like Andre would watch scenes of the film and then improvise over them. And, uh, we just recorded all this stuff. He had a literal garbage bag, um, filled with like 14 weird custom flutes from around the world that he's been uh, collecting. It was uh, two garbage bags. There were two? <laughs> <Yeah>. Okay. Uh, <laughs> but actual just black plastic garbage bags. Yeah. Uh, and he would just reach in and pull out a new one and be like, this one's from Thailand. And it would make a like a totally different sound. Um, and uh, we're super fans. And mm-hmm. it was very, I was so intimidated. I don't know if I said a single word for the, those three hours. You know, I just kind of like... Uh, Hit in the corner. It's a different film. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) One of one of the things that uh, our composers pointed out, which I thought was really interesting, is like even though it's a different medium and a different instrument for Andre, um, the way he blows into and 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 plays the the flute is actually very um, rhythmically. similar to his flow you know as a as a rapper mm-hmm. um and uh i don't know how much that, that that's the kind of thing that's going to be really buried underneath the score and maybe you'll have to go back and really listen to it but it's 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 it was a fascinating thing to again it's like this movie is about opening up other universes opening up other versions of ourselves you know mm-hmm. each every actor got to show off another universe of themselves right and so andre getting to show off a completely different version of himself and at the same time you still see the core you still see the musician um who is a creative inventive and has this rhythm um but it's it's funneled through flutes and um there's a couple scenes that the flute really shines and just like makes the moment feel so good and i'm so i'm so excited that he's in it and behind the scenes it was like this burst of uh enthusiasm with all of us when we collected that material and suddenly like as we were working on our you know 50 different tracks we had to uh create for the movie we had this like golden ingredient and we'd be like "Ooh, there's some flute in there how fun like oh i can hear it yeah (laughs) it was exciting 
Well, I this film is the perfect film coming out of whatever version of the pandemic we're in now. And I thank you so much for making it. Uh, we've been speaking with uh, the Daniels, Daniel Kwan and Daniel Scheinert from the film. Everything, everywhere, all at once. It's in theaters unless this comes out later, in which case just watch it somehow. Yeah, just watch <laughs> it. <laughs> thank you so much for being on Bitch Talk. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Very excited to be here at, at our in-person press day uh, at the Ritz-Carlton in San Francisco. It's for everything, everywhere, all at once. And we have three lead characters who I would love for to introduce themselves. So I'll start with... Hi, this is Stephanie Hsu, and I play Joy slash Joe Boo. Hello, I'm Michelle Yeoh, and I play Evelyn Wong. Hi, I'm Ki Hui Kwan, and I play Wayman slash Alpha Wayman slash CEO Wayman. <laughs> what does that even mean, Keith? <laughs> well, that's why you have to go see the movie and find out. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to start with Michelle. Um, I, I read a lot of the press notes, and there's something that I read um, that I wanted to share with you and then ask you about. Um, you shared with one of the Daniels one evening when you guys were partying after shooting. Um, I wonder what my career would have looked like if I had done this movie a long time ago. And so I want to know, what did you mean by sharing that? And how do you think your career is going to change now? I have learned never to give your phone to the Daniels. And <laughs> never share things with them if you think they're not going to tell the world. <laughs> no, it was a moment of, I think this uh, movie for me has brought in a lot of emotions on many personal levels. Um, I've had... I still have an amazing career. I've been very, very blessed with amazing roles, fantastic roles, opportunities to um, showcase what I can do. But then it's always been limited. Um, maybe it's because of our color, our race. The, there hasn't been so many roles that were written. But I've been fortunate to have gotten some of the best ones already. But this is the first time in many years that I've acted as uh, the woman is the superhero and an older woman is a superhero. Then an older Asian woman is a superhero. Um, and I've been waiting for a long time for this. So I, damn the Daniels. <laughs> I was very, very grateful that they had the audacity, you know, the fearlessness to write a character like this and to think that I would do it, to think I would be crazy enough. Because if you look at the role, it is, it's completely out there. It's taking a lot of chances because uh, I, when I was doing it, I realized I'm doing the first of many things I've never done before. And maybe it has taken all this time to get to prepare for a role like this. Okay, Stephanie. <laughs> I'm going to go a different route. The outfits for Jobu Tupaki uh, are sick. <laughs> Were you totally on board for the different transformations you had to make to play two parts in the film? Designer Shirley Karata is truly a visionary artist, and I would say that everyone who worked on this film is not only kind and loving and brilliant, but their heart, their hearts of an artist. And I felt so lucky to get to work with her to try on the craziest things that I know I'll never get to wear again. And to, you know, I think that's in some ways what you always dream of as an actor is that you get to do all these things that you've never done before or things that you could have never even imagined that you would get the opportunity to do or share. Um, so yeah, that was like, you know, so juicy, so dope, so crazy, so many changes. Amazing. Were you ever like, oh no, or keep adding on? Oh, I was like, yes, yes, more. <laughs> um, there are looks that also, I don't even think, I can't think of which ones didn't make it, but you know, there were many, many more looks that, that we didn't even get to showcase. And, um, I think the, the thing about the costumes is that they're crazy, but they're also very high fashion, and that is definitely part of the artistry of Shirley, um, which is actually also very much the aesthetic of the film, which is that it's a lot, 
but there's something quite beautiful about it. And I would attribute that to the Daniels and also our DP Larkin, who Mm -hmm. they're able to capture the beauty even in the chaos Mm -hmm. of it all. It's it's seriously the big, the everything everywhere all at once title really encapsulates what we are trying to do as well. You know, it's that big, everybody was so invested and in all the different universes, no matter how crazy it, it would feel at that time, but you believed these characters were real, are real. You know, you believe, like in the hot dog universe, right? Yes. I mean, when you even say it out loud, people go, okay, you guys are... Cr-. But the love that was between the, the Jamie Lee Curtis mm-hmm. and Evelyn was just palpable. I mean, if you ignored everything else and just looked at the two of them looked the way they were with each other. Mm -hmm. There was no doubt that you would not doubt for a single minute. And I felt that all the different characters in all the universes were looking for each other constantly. Mm -hmm. So at the end of the day, by the time you finished with Bagel, (laughs) it's all about love and family and choosing to be with each other always, no matter what. Mm -hmm. We will always choose each other. And it's so important right now. Yes. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes. I think that's why our movie is coming out out at such an opportune time. Yeah. You know, and people are wanting and needing to go go back out to the cinemas because that's what we we do our movies for to be watching it in the cinemas to it's a shared experience Mm -hmm. and this movie is very interesting because it needs a shared experience it needs to have each other to laugh at it's like what are you laughing at it's like oh now i you know and it bounces so uh, infectious in that way and under you know in the the dim lights of the cinema that's when the magic happens and it all comes together yeah this movie particularly Mm -hmm. when you're with people it's a communal surrender to catharsis also and to be able to have like an emotional journey with people right now complete strangers is so important and healing Mm -hmm. and i think that as crazy as this movie is, it's definitely going to make people laugh. But I I do think it's going to offer some healing, which I feel really excited for. I was going to say not only laugh, but cheer Mm. loudly. (laughs) I I want to get to key before we have to wrap, but you've been cast in very iconic roles throughout your career, including this one. This is, this is going to be up there for you. Um, What was the impetus for you to go after this part? And as a filmmaker yourself, were you ever scratching your head and like, how are the Daniels going to do this? Uh, well, first of all, um, uh, uh, I was uh, I was very happy when I decided to get back into acting after seeing Michelle's uh, movie Crazy Rich Asians in, in 2018. Uh, and uh, when I got myself an agent and I heard about this project, I was so excited. At the same time, I was really nervous. Uh, right before I was scheduled to go in to audition for the Daniels, uh, they sent over the script. And I remember loving it. And I laughed so hard and so loud, and I, I just felt that this role was written for me. Uh, so when I went, I auditioned for them a couple of times, and, and I'm grateful that they have given me this opportunity to play this really amazing character, not just one version, but three versions of them. Uh, you know, um, I, I hope the audience will find it amusing and fun to see me in this, where in a role where I get to play a middle-aged man. Uh, and, um, and you, know, they, you know, hopefully they'll find that new and interesting, and I hope I don't disappoint. Um, when I read the script, I think because I went to film school and also I was able to, to really work behind the camera and kind of understand, you know, making a movie not just from an actor's point of view, but also from uh, uh, all points of views. Uh, I thought they wrote this amazing, brilliant, moving script. Uh, and I had no doubt that they can pull it off because of what they did with Swiss, Swiss Army Man. If they had me, you know, laughing, crying, and falling in love with a corpse that farts, you know, throughout the entire movie, if they can do that, they can do anything. One of the things that I that was most challenging for us was the shooting schedule. It was scheduled for 38 days over a week, over eight week period, and uh, and for the amount of stuff that we have to shoot. Uh, I thought that was going to be a big challenge. And again, that is a, that is a credit to uh, Jonathan Wong, our producer, and then our UPM and also our uh, production supervisor. Uh, we didn't have you know, room for hiccups or errors. Um, and we just, it was just meticulously planned. 
uh, and we, that's how we finished the movie. And we just had a really good time, but also every single one of us came really prepared and we all had one vision, which was to make the best movie we could possibly make given all the limitations that we had. Uh, so I can't wait for the audience to go see it and, and <laughs> to, to enjoy the movie just as much as we enjoy making it. One question to wrap. Um, how do you all think this film will change how Hollywood casts Asian actors? I just, I think, you know, I've said this a few times, but what I love the most about our movie is that it is the multiverse, it is wild, it is unlike anything anyone has ever seen, so much so that it kind of transcends identity politics. And, and to me, that like pushes this moment over the edge where it's like, yes, it is very important that this is an Asian family, but also it is just a family. And I'm so excited for Hollywood to continue to kind of flow into this new space where you're not trying to market something just because of how people look, but it's actually just a part of the fabric of this world we live in, which is that people come from everywhere and stories are from everywhere. Um, so I think that is what I'm most excited about. And I hope, and I do think that this kind of, you don't even think about it and it sort of just brings you to another form of how you're brought into a, a story or a family. Well, I, I mean, I think my return to acting is proved uh, how important it is for not just Asians, but for all groups of people to be represented in entertainment. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, crazy which Asians dare me to pursue acting again. And uh, until you see it, you really can't imagine that it can also be you up there on the screen. Uh, and And my gosh, I mean, I... <laughs> I don't know how many others out there like myself uh, who shared in the same dream that lay dormant. So I just, um, you know, I, I hope there are, first of all, I'm very optimistic to see how, you know, where we are right now and where things uh, appear to be going. Uh, of course, there are a lot more work to be done. Uh, all big changes, uh, all uh, sustainable improvements happen gradually. Uh, but I, I'm, I'm hopeful and, uh, and you know, I'm inspired. And you know, a lot, you know, over the years, uh, you know, I, I meet a lot of Asian talents working in Hollywood today and they always say, hey man, you're the OG. Thank you for paving the way for us to be here. And it's interesting because it's actually them also that paved the way for my return. So I am mm. grateful to, to where everything is right now. I think what Stephanie was saying, I hope that it's, it's about good storytelling. Mm. And I think at the end of the day, we should transcend the color, the race, or what is telling a good story about family, about love, emotions. Even with Crazy Rich Asians, after a while you forget, oh, is it a cast of all Asian looking faces? It, it does it, is that the point? You know, but it carried a lot of weight. And there was a moment, many things waiting on the sidelines. What if it didn't work? Was it fair to have put all that weight on this one movie? And thank God, somehow, but it wasn't, it wasn't a, uh, by luck it happened. The filmmakers, starting with John Chu, uh, Nina Jacobson, John Bonotti, they respected the culture. They told the story from where it deserves to have that kind of integrity and honesty and reflect on what it should be reflected. It's not just about diversity or you know inclusivity. It's very easy to add on all these words, but all these characters deserve to have their dreams, their hopes, and to be told in the proper way. So right now we are having the opportunity. There are much, much more opportunities for women, directors, in, in front of the cam, behind the cameras, in all the different roles, where we are, we are also fighting for gender equality. We're fighting for all the voices that has not been heard for a very long time, that has kept such a talent away for 20 years, right? I mean, yes, it, it is true. We have been fighting for that. And I am so happy that I can see more opportunities for the next generation who, can, who has come up and say, yes, I can see myself up there because 10 years ago, it would be like, um, who's... you know? And if they don't see it, it's almost like when it's not visualized, it can be real. So 
it is time has come and it is changing. You're right, it's gradually changing. But we have to be consistent. We have to be true to ourselves. We have to be the ones who push the right stories to be told and told in the proper way. You know, we are we are the ones. There are stereotypes. There's nothing wrong with stereotypes because you know that's that's the diversity and the difference of of people. But how we tell them, how we respect them, that's a different matter. So we all move forward, you know, in one united front. And, and I think in this way, we will be able to tell better stories. Starting with everything, everywhere, all at once. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank you, Michelle, he and Stephanie for being on Bitch Talk. Yeah. Thank, you. Thank, you. Thank, you for us. Thank you for having us. If you like what you hear, rate and subscribe wherever you listen to podcasts. For more information about us, you can head to bitchtalkpodcast.com. This podcast is created, hosted, and executive produced by Aaron Lim. My co-host is Angela Tabora, a.k.a. Captain Party. The show's edited by producer Shar. We're powered by GoTo Productions.